Welcome to the 19th session of our reading group of the Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution by the General, uh, General, was it Group of International Communists? There we go. By the Group of International, <laughs> the Group of International Communists. Can't believe I, this stage, I was like, GIC, what does that stand for? God damn. So it's our last session today where we're going to round up our reading of the introduction by Paul Matic from 1970 for one of these editions. I don't know if it's the first or second edition. I think it was the first edition. Anybody fancy reading this first section? It is true that the exact relation between producer and his product as elaborated in the fundamental principles concerns only the individual's part in production. After subtraction of those parts of production which are necessary for social consumption and the reproduction of social production. The process of socialization is expressed in the reduction of individual consumption and the increase in public consumption, by means of which communist production finally tends towards the abolition of the calculation of labor time and distribution. The economic structure without a market requires the organization of consumers into cooperatives in direct contact with the factories in which the individual needs in reference to consumption and production can be collectively expressed. It is a shame, however, that this is the least developed part of the fundamental principles since it is precisely the market economy's alleged freedom of choice in consumption which is utilized by capitalism and is in its apologetics. In reality, it is entirely possible to establish consumption requirements without recourse to the market and to do so even more effectively because in communist society, the distortions in market demand caused by a form of distribution linked to the existence of social classes will disappear. In production as well, Calculations can only be approximate since the process of labor and reproduction is subject to constant change. The calculation of social average labor time for aggregate production is subject to a certain delay and the results obtained are always lagging behind actual reproduction. The precision of the calculation refers to a moment in the past and however much it may be possible to curtail the time required for reporting by means of modern methods and technologies, social average labor time will constantly vary. This lack of precision does not present an insuperable obstacle for calculation of production and reproduction at either the level of production itself or at a more general level but the actual situation will differ from the projected result. And only in this difference will the real state of production be found. In the calculation of labor time, it is not a matter of obtaining a complete correspondence of production time as obtained via the unit of measurement to average labor time actually employed and the resulting production, but of ordering and distributing social labor something which by its very nature can only be approximately achieved. For a planned communist economy, such a result is perfectly acceptable. So, yeah, so the first part there, he basically talks about getting into a little bit of a similar discussion, Not, I suppose a little bit, with respect to the last episode where I had a debate with uh, Andrew Kleinman on this, but getting towards... The fact that in the fundamental principles, they don't really get into much discussion on the exact interoperations between, say, consumer cooperatives and factories and this management of production and output. So the, the, this, you know, this, this unity of production and distribution, it doesn't get into, say, some of the organizational forms. And I think that's like the critique here by Matic is reasonably fair. Well, I don't think it's fair that it's not included in the fundamental principles. I don't know. I feel like I think he does. I think they do get the fundamental principles, but there are definitely stuff to be built on here. That's important work to be done based on these principles. That's the way I look at it. He then goes on to talk about, you know, how precise the actual labor time calculations will be and whether this is a problem or not. Like, you know, we'd look at capitalism 
and they don't have incredibly precise calculations of stuff. Prices vary quite a lot. You know, the socially necessary labor time in a product is actually not, even though it is the value of the product, it's not the price. There's all manner of other things going on at the same time, siphoning value away, whatever. But it is able to allow for reproduction to continue. And I think, you know, I think he reaches this, the correct conclusion here for a planned a communist economy, such a result is perfectly acceptable. So I, I think that I don't have much to say about this other than I would say that like the the price of a of an object in both capitalism and in I think in in in, in what we're saying in communism is not just a single estimation of the socially necessary labor time in that precise moment. It's one that's been averaged over time. Like a factory doesn't sell if they make a shoe uh, and the machine breaks down one day and they end up having all the machine idle for half the day and they produce only half the number of shoes. They don't double the price of the shoe on that particular day. That the price for the shoe is averaged over a long period of time, you know, over that's to do with long periods of wage inflation or means of production, turnover, fixed capital turnover. So there's lots of things that go into generating the price of an object under capitalism like over time and it's not a simple average of right now so i i don't see that it's much of a a thing to worry about at all it seems to me to be nearly to be nitpicking that labor time won't be able to be 100 million percent accurate in in in, in any effect the, the thing is an average you know by definition it is an average so the average being over time is I don't see it has, it has been any kind of a sort of a problem if we're already averaging over space. We do live in space time anyway, don't we? Do you want to take the next bit then, Slavic? Sure. The authors of the fundamental principles conceive of the organization of production in such a way that the exact relation between the producer and his product will become the basis of the social reproduction process. They see this as a fundamental problem of the proletarian revolution, because it is only in this way that the erection of an apparatus over the heads of the producers can be avoided. It is only by means of the definition of the relation between the product and producer that the role of managers and administrators in the division of the social product can be abolished. The necessary precondition for a classless society is thus the producer's self-determination of the distribution of their products. In reality, the, the determination of the direct relation between producer and product can only be the result of a victorious proletarian revolution, which establishes the council system as the form of social organization. In that case, there may be less need to regulate the productive process according to distribution. One could very well imagine a controlled distribution of the means of consumption as well as an uncontrolled one, without this necessarily leading to the existence of a new privileged strata. Furthermore, the sole assumption of a norm for distribution is not a sufficient condition for the establishment of a communist economy. The latter, in effect, must not be based simply on the participation of the producers in the division of the social product, but beyond these problems in the material conditions of social production. Let's stop it there. Okay, so there's quite a there's quite a lot going on in this little section here. I, I think there's basically, well, there's, a, there's about two or three good, interesting points here, some of which are I find very weird and wrong, and some of which are, are, are very good. In reality, the determination of the direct relation between the producer and the product can only be the result of a victorious proletarian revolution which establishes the council system as the form of social organization. You know, I think that's pretty much spot on. I don't have any problem with that. And then he says, in, in, the, in that case, there may well be need to regulate the productive process, may, may well be less need to regulate the productive process according to distribution. One could very well imagine a controlled distribution of the means of consumption as well as an uncontrolled one without this necessarily leading to the existence of a new privileged strata. Like, I think that's a very, very 
throwaway comment that leads one to kind of disregard the kind of basic argument in the book. You know, like what 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 is a what is an uncontrolled distribution of the means of consumption? Is he making the case for that the 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 consumption is based on need? Is that what he's trying to say? Or is he saying like you could just imagine all manner of you know crazy uncontrolled ways without it leading to a new privileged strata? I think if anything, if you don't have sound economic laws to back your system of distribution, particularly as you're coming out of capitalism with its kind of bourgeois mentality, you're going to end up, you know, if the thing doesn't run smooth, it's going to end up with people uh, reverting to a previous kind of distribution form. What do people make of that sentence? I find that sentence just so throwaway. It's like a it's like a one-liner to kind of throw away the whole idea of like this unity between distribution and production in just a kind of a one-liner and saying, oh yeah, you can imagine any kind of a mad thing happening. I'm sure it'd be grand. Slavic. Yeah, I agree with your feelings there. It strikes me as, I guess what bothers me the most about it is, it's almost saying like the take is needed approach is kind of what it seems to be saying, which the book pretty clearly critiques. And it just, I mean, not having to control for it sounds nice, but if you want to plan something, like if if you have a, a pretty significant project as we are going to have with like the climate crisis and whatnot, then you should probably have a pretty decent sense of how much consumption there is and and controlling for it. Like it just strikes me as very strange why you wouldn't want to have that level of control. Yeah, like, and he only really talks about it as a as an uncontrolled distribution here. But like, I think in other other parts, if I'm correct, he also talks about like not needing to do labor time planning at all. You know, so it it seems to it like it goes against like Marx's theory as well, like the idea that you know the the new society is born out of the old and it will have its it will bear certain features of the old. And us with our bourgeois mentality of not wanting to get screwed over by by somebody else, you know, I don't want him to only have to work less than me to get to get the same levels of consumption. That like it seems to just have this, it seems to be a very an ahistorical approach. It means it, it means that we want a non-materialist approach. We want to go from A to C without having to go through B. I find when you say a phrase like one could very well imagine. I think you have to give more detail when you're talking theoretical stuff. You have to actually give an example of how it would work and 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 also like how you would game the system, like how how a system like that could be gamed to such an extent that it could it could fall apart. Right, and with with the level of complexity of inputs and out, I mean, I, it just strikes me as strange that you could just do away with a controlled distribution. Like you need to be able to distribute things globally, right? Outputs, right? So you need to know where they go and how much each neighborhood is going to need. And and then you want to have warehouses to store those things adequately, right? Right. So it devolves, it kind of devolves into somebody's doing the planning, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, someone's going to have to at the end of the day. <laughs> they're going to send them, they're going to have to send this shit somewhere. And how are they going to send it there? They're going to send it by based on consumption, whereby like people are doing it based on their income, or somebody, to, somebody is going to decide where to send this stuff. Now, maybe you could have a democratic decision to distribute stuff all over the place equally, but like that's highly uncontrolled. I don't know. I just, I just find this, this willing, this wanting to jump from stage A to stage C as uh, I just kind of, kind of find it an infuriating argument, to be honest. And the next sentence here, furthermore, the sole assumption of a norm for distribution is not a sufficient condition for the establishment of communist economy. The latter in effect must not be based simply on the participation of the producers in the division of the social product, but beyond these problems in the material conditions of social production. Yeah, like I don't think the, the book is ever making the case that it's only distribution you need to sort out. You know, it's fundamentally not saying that. This is kind of like, it feels like it's a critique that is not in the book, of, of what is not said in the book, of, of of something that is not what has been put forward in the book 
that A, you just have to sort out your distribution without sorting out all of the the general production of life. You know, this idea that you have the gills and the gills get their their reproduction funds directly from their sale of their products and they get to choose what kind of working conditions, means of production and stuff they they get to uh, to install. You know, that's all built into this system. So I kind of find like it's an argument, not a very um, generous to the book type of argument. Okay, do you want to hit the next paragraph there? Sure. In capitalism, distribution is only apparently regulated by the market. While production must be realized on the market, the market itself is determined by the production of capital. The production of exchange value and the accumulation of capital are the basis of the production process. Use value in production only as a means to increase exchange value. The real needs of the producer can only be taken into account if they coincide with the imperative of accumulation. Production, the production of surplus value, is regulated in accordance with exchange value relations, which are only accidentally coincide with the use value relations. Communist society produces only for use and must, for that reason, adapt production and distribution to the real needs of society. Production is prior to distribution, although it is determined by the needs of the consumers. But the organization of production requires something more than the exact determination of the relation between producer and its product. It requires control over the needs and capacities of production of all society in the material forms and an adequate distribution of social labor. The council system will at the very least have to create institutions which enable it to supervise the needs and the possibilities of the whole society. The information thus obtained must lead to decisions which cannot be made separately by each factory organization. The structure of the council system must be such that production will be centrally regulated, yet without infringing upon the autonomy of the producers. The factories themselves, furthermore, the implementation of the decision of the workers will be left to the councils without thereby leading to an ascendancy of the councils over the workers. In national production as well, from a more general perspective, organizational methods can be discovered which will coordinate these institutions above the factory level under the control of the producers. But such a solution of the centralism federalism contradiction, which is in any event advocated in the fundamental principles, cannot be resolved so easily by way of registration of the economic process in general social accounting, and will most likely require other institutions integrated into the council system, which will be specifically dedicated to economic organization. In the fundamental principles, a rejection of a state-directed central administration of production and distribution is based on the Russian experience, which actually does not apply to the council system but to state capitalism. But in the latter case, it is also true that production and distribution are not the responsibility of planning institutions but of the state, which uses planning institutions as its instruments. It is the political dictatorship of the state apparatus over the workers and not economic planning, which has led to a new kind of exploitation in which the planning authorities also participate. In the absence of the political dictatorship of the state apparatus, the workers would not be compelled to submit to a central administration of production and distribution. So the, the previous kind of two paragraphs we're making this point. Uh, what I think is a, is a is true. They're making the point. They're making the kind of case. Let me let me read this here for a for essentially cybernetic principles, right? The structure of the council system must be such that production will be centrally regulated, yet without infringing upon the autonomy of the producers. In national production, as well, from a more general perspective, organizational methods can be discovered which will coordinate these institutions above the factory level under the control of the producers. But such a solution of the centralism, federalism contradiction, which is uh, in any event advocated in the fundamental principles, cannot be resolved so easily by way of a registration 
of the economic process in general social accounting and will most likely require other institutions integrated into the council system which will be specifically dedicated to economic organization like you know absolutely this tension between a, a plan and autonomy is precisely the kind of synthesis that i think stafford beer's kind of vsm viable systems model is trying to facilitate i feel like that type of design sits so elegantly on top of of this that it seems to you know just be hand in glove with what has been said here and i think that this is i think that he's correct in saying like that this stuff is the, the accounting is not going to do all this there's other structures I think in the book they actually say similar stuff. Did they say similar stuff in the book? I feel like there are lines like that. There's times when he points to, say, higher councils in the abstract and economic congress in one, in one portion. But I think a body of work that needs to be done is to integrate VSM uh, organizational forms on top of labor time planning. I think that's a very fruitful piece of work, research to be done, to be honest. I think it's kind of like if we're interested in a commie or in a commie society that's where we should be trying to put our work theoretically okay slam i'm going to give you a rest you did a lot of reading there somebody else want to give a go patrick how do you feel about doing a bit of reading here the first requirement for communist production and distribution is therefore that there must be no state apparatus existing alongside or above the councils and that the state function, the suppression of counter-revolutionary tendencies, be exercised by the workers themselves, organized in their councils, any part which, as a fraction of the workers, aspires the state power or sets itself up as a state apparatus after seizing power, will undoubtedly attempt to assume control over production and distribution, and will seek to perpetuate this control in order to preserve the positions it has occupied. If a minority controls the majority, then exploitation still exists. The uh, council system cannot allow any state to subsist alongside it without abdicating its mission. But without such state power separated from society, any planning of production and distribution can only be carried out by the council system. The uh, planning institutions themselves are also enterprises, which together with the other enterprises are united in a single council system, concerning which it should now be pointed out that the working class too is subject to constant change. The fundamental principles considers the industrial proletariat gathered in its factories to be the socially decisive class. The council system based in the factories determines the structure of society and obliges the other classes the independent peasantry, for example, to integrate into the new social economic system. Over the last 40 years, the working class, that is, the category of, of those who work for a wage or salary, has grown. Yet, in relation to the entire population, the number of industrial workers has declined. One part of the white-collar employees work in the factories together with the manual workers Another part works in the field of distribution and administration. Since production is becoming increasingly more dependent on science and the productive forces of science have a tendency to surpass those in direct labor, the universities, at least in part, can also be used, viewed as factories. And if in capitalism, surplus value always means unpaid labor, surplus labor, regardless of the state of science, Social wealth in communism is not manifested as an increase in labor, but as the continuous reduction of necessary labor as a consequence of scientific development, which has been freed from capitalist limitations. Production is progressively socialized as a consequence of the increasing participation of the masses in the production process. Working masses who can only exist in the strictest collaboration and the reciprocal interpenetration in all kinds of work. In a word, the definition of the working class has been expanded. It is more inclusive today than it was 40 years ago. The changes in the organization of labor already contain a supersession, the division of labor, 
of the separation between manual and intellectual labor, between office and the factory, between the workers and managers. It is a process which, by the way of participation of, of all the producers in production, which is now socially oriented, could lead to a council system which includes all of society and thus puts an end to class rule. Okay, let's have a, a look at this. This is him kind of going off on a solo run, if you ask me. He starts off with looking at that if there is a, a state power as opposed to the council power, you are going to have, you know, you're, you're going to have some, somebody has to come to control one or the other. Either the state gets destroyed by the council system or the state comes to dominate the council system and then the state takes control of production and distribution like they did in the Soviet Union. So he, he's, he, he makes this case where the council system has been the primary force in society, you know, and but then he, he goes into a discussion of the changes in the working class in the last 40 years. So this is would have been from the 30s to the 70s, how the industrial proletariat is growing, but shrinking as a proportion of the entire proletariat and that people are basically working in in more uh, proles in administration and all these different areas than they would have been in the 1920s, 30s. So he says, in the word, the definition of the working class has been expanded, is more inclusive today than it was 40 years ago. And then he goes on to make this claim here, which I think is, you know, I, I kind of consider this as being not to have played out in history so far. Whether it's totally wrong or not, we'll find out, I suppose, in a few million years. The changes in the organization of labor already contain a supersession of the division of labor. Okay, so the division of labor is getting broke down of the separation between manual and intellectual labor, between office and factory, between workers and managers. It is now a process which, by way of the participation of all the producers in production, which is now socially oriented, could lead to a council system which includes all of society and thus puts an end to classroom. Like, I don't know about any EE, but I don't think the the division of labor between separating manual intellectual labor, office and factory, and workers and managers has has, has happened much. What do people think? I, I kind of find that slightly brain rot. Like, who here thinks that the division of labor between, you know, manual intellectual labor is more prevalent now than it was, say, years and years ago? I'm not I'm not buying it. I just I, I simply I don't buy that. <laughs> Like under the Blairites, they wanted they had this idea in the like in the nineties that you know just send everybody to edu to college to get every in a, get everybody a college education, and then they had an overproduction of uh, educated uh, young people, and they quickly realized that they they didn't need these many intellectual workers, and a lot of them were just ending up you know working in you know manual labor still you know, working as baristas or, uh, you know, working in McDonald's or whatever with a with an art, a PhD in, in art history or something. And so they re they introduced, uh, they, they upped the tuition fees and everything to kind of reduce the number of people that would, in, that would go into uh, higher education because there was an overproduction of them. So I don't see how this is true. I think the tendency for capital is to maintain divisions between intellectual and manual labor. What's it like in the States? You're all in the States now, aren't you? Alex, Slavic, and JT. Are you all in the States, Patrick? Is this not like flying, you know, strict in the face of all of these people like that have PhDs now working in, uh, I don't know, Starbucks? I guess you need like a degree or a, you're expected to get a higher degree for the same kind of position 20 years ago. But that doesn't mean that that position is necessarily less, you know, that doesn't mean the division of labor has changed per se. They just have higher requirements for it. But you're not doing anything differently. Right. And then the other thing, yeah, it strikes me. What what time is he writing this? 1970. Okay. I, I mean... It, Part of the issue has been with the declining industrial industrial sector, like hasn't I, I would have thought the there would have been sharper sharper divides between mental and manual labor because more things are getting automated, right? And so 
therefore your role in the productive process tends to be more rote or simplified. It, it tends to, yeah, working in an automated process means that they don't need to have someone with as much specialization perhaps to manage it. Yeah, right. But Patrick, were you trying to get in before? Yeah, well, I mean, I I, I think, you know, you know, with the automation and a lot of the technologies that have come since have so much computing and the economy has just kind of made workers more replaceable and so that's you know so that that's part of the de-skilling and i and, and i definitely second what slavic was saying it's just kind of like i mean in in terms of expectations for for training it's just like you know undergrad became what you know like a high school diploma was in the 70s and before absolutely it's just uh, everybody just has to spend longer in school to get the same level of job that they would have had before. Like my father was, you know, a kind of dairy manager and he he had only like, I think, uh, yeah, a simple, I don't know if he had even a one year course in, you know, lab tech, you know, and <laughs> that was enough for a managerial position probably in the 60s, 70s. But like now you you do well to get a job with it. Okay. Patrick, do you want to do the next bit of reading and then I'll do the last sure. bit? One can share the distrust advice in the fundamental principles for the managers, technicians, and scientists who aggregate to themselves the right to the direct production and distribution without overlooking the fact, however, that apart from the managers, the others are producers. The council system necessarily puts them to, to work alongside the other producers and strips them of the privileged positions they occupy in capitalism. Nonetheless, since the backward steps in the social domain are always possible, it's clear that even a council system can decay. As a result, for the example, of the lack of interest of the producers in their own autonomy and the, and the consequent transfer of the f- functions of the councils to, the, to system insiders, who then become independent of the producers. The authors believe that this, is the, that this danger can be avoided by the means of a new calculation of production as the general basis of production. But since the calculation of producers must first of all be announced, the hoped-for effect could, could then be lost due to the series of, of, of modifications. Okay. Uh, let, let, let's stop it there. That's a okay. kind of a, I think that's a very important point here. Mm-hmm. So, so the authors believe that this danger, so this is like you know, bureaucracy forming, can be avoided by means of a new calculation of production as the basis, the general basis of production. But since this calculation of production must first be all announced, the hope for effect could then be lost to a series of modifications. Like we've had this kind of discussion, you know, I think over the weeks that we've been doing this reading group of this, this idea of the price policy versus like the amount of labor being contained in this item. So it's like, if you have a, I think it was Kielce was kind of arguing with us quite a bit for a while was about like, well, could you not just have like a sales tax? Right. And this idea of allowing these little small scale infringements on the general principle of sale tax here to disincentivize people, say, smoking or, you know, injecting themselves with heroin or whatever it is. That these like little incentive schemes of you know changing the price of this, putting in another little tax on this, and just manipulating society through these through these forms is a way that you le- that you can lose like this kind of control, independent control, producer-led control over the means of production. And I think that is a fundamental a fundamental point that's been made here by Paul Maddock, and I think it's something that needs to be thought about. Where do people stand on, 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 like, do people have this fear? Because I have a fear of that you could lose the fundamental principles because people like to modify. It's like you create a wonderful piece of code, right? You're writing a, a great piece of code for, and you're working in a, in a company. And then uh, your boss will come and say, but this client wants it this other way. And could you not just, like, hack it a little bit for that client and you hack it a bit for that? And then this other person, could you not just hack it and, for this and and I end up you end up with Windows, you know, instead of having like Linux, you end up with like a monstrosity operating system, you know. And I think there's definitely a kind of a lack of emphasis on this risk. Anybody else have anything to say on that? 
Patrick, you're a pro. You do programming, don't you? <laughs> uh, no, just for fun. I'm 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 a horticulturist. Yeah, but you, I can tell that you like programming. <laughs> yeah, I like Python, but um, yeah. I mean, I I think people try to game any sort of system, but I mean, I, I feel like the system that they're describing, they're trying to design in like uh, maximum transparency. You know. So you know, Alex works in 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 IT and stuff like that, and uh, I'm sure when you're on the front line of actually coding in organizations you you're constantly struggling with a kind of creating the perfect code and the aesthetic and and it getting crushed by uh the real world <laughs> and like that's the kind of problem with this book where we can you can say oh we have these we have this strict link between work and bigger output but like the tendency for people is to tinker uh, and to push and i think like any system that was was built like would have to fundamentally as a fundamental kind of component of it not just say like the class relations but a fundamental sticking to labor as the price of the product being strictly linked to the labor contained in it yeah in in computer science which is what i studied and in software engineering it's very much like an artisan feel they think themselves yeoman and that obviously does not work in the economy but it's it combines the like desire of elegance from mathematics with the desire of an aesthetic from poetry for example uh it, not to be like too emotional about it but you know you hit the real world and yeah it's mostly about like is it formatted syntactically correctly and is it maintainable and readable and there is value in it being maintainable and readable but it is it is definitely a different more coarse feel than what a a free-minded you know unchained programmer would typically do yeah and also just the the monetary implications coming in you know like could we eke a little bit more income out by just like destroying the elegance of this solution <laughs> and your boss goes okay well then do it and you're like oh god damn it here we go we're on the slippery slope now to complete code annihilation yeah that's working in a team yeah yeah <laughs> in a council should we say yes i think that's an important point you know it like this slippage from this elegance of the labor time planning into a price policy by you know a thousand cuts and it, through those thousand cuts you could end up with like political factions forming to say want to increase certain stuff in certain ways in price policies and stuff like that to their to their betterment or to the the deterrence of is deterrence is that a word deterrence of another group you know i think that that could very easily happen that's a big danger if you ask me okay let's get on to the next section here as the authors explain it the system once established is complete by means of the objective operation of production of the control of the latter in relation to reproduction the system is defended against the decession of individuals to decision-making power, as in the case of state capitalism. The new system of production and distribution itself guarantees the communist society, although the objective operation of production is in reality always guaranteed by individuals. In capitalism, too, there, there's an objective operation of production, which is dictated by the law of the market to which all individuals are subject. It is the system which dominates man. The uh, fetishistic outward aspect of the system conceals the reality of the social relation of man's exploitation of man. Behind the economic categories are classes and individuals, and every time the fetishism of the system is overcome, the open struggle between classes and individuals comes to light, while communism is also a a social system it does not act above men but but through them it has no life of its own to which individuals must necessarily adapt the objective operation of production is determined by individuals but these individuals come comprise the uh, council system these brief observations will be enough to indicate that in the fundamental principles we are not presented with the finished programs 
but with an initial attempt to approach the problem of communist production and distribution. And although the fundamental principles address a future social state, it is at the same time an historical document which sheds light upon a stage reached in past debates. Its authors dealt with the questions of socialization, which were current more than half a century ago, and some of their arguments are no longer pertinent. The fundamental principles was an intervention in the debate between the theoreticians of natural economy and the representatives of the market, demonstrating the mistaken position of both. Socialism is generally no longer considered in terms of a new society, but as a variant of capitalism. The defenders of the market economy speak of a planned market economy, while the defenders of a planned economy utilize market-based economics. The uh, organization of production based on use value does not rule out an unequal distribution of consumption of goods through price manipulation. Economic laws are, are thought to be independent of, of the type of society, and at most, the, the current discussions revolve around what mixture of capitalism and socialism is more economical. So this is kind of just the beginning of a, a kind of a wrap up here where he's talking kind of about where the fundamentals principles and the council system comes in, talking about how there is an objective operation of production in capitalism, which is dictated by the law of the market, which all subjects are, all individuals are subject. It is a system which dominates man, as opposed to, you know, the council system where man operates his life. While communism is also a social system, it does not act above men, but through them. It is no life of its own to which individuals must necessarily adapt. Okay, and then he, he talks about is like the fundamental principles not being a finished program, and it is a, a kind of like a historical document where it has you know making points, which is true. It is a it, 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 largely when you read it now, it it seems to be fifty percent theory, fifty percent history, making arguments against the the dominant wings of the socialist, communist, anarchist movement of its day, and placing itself. In a different position to them. He, he talks then as well about, you know, when he's writing this in the 60s, how socialism has been basically no longer considered in terms of a new society, but as a variant of capitalism, which I think is fundamentally true. You know, today, like if you call yourself a socialist, you're probably thought of as some kind of sock dem in the West. And if you call yourself a communist, you're thought of some kind of, you know, Chinese style social democrat. <laughs> I suppose you could call the Chinese. So it's all kind of morphed into just variants of capitalism. And this book is making an entirely kind of different argument for a kind of communism of, of what the type Marx and Engels were arguing for. I suppose I'll read this last section. I, Patrick, thanks for all that reading here. The economic principle, that is the principle of economic rationality, which, as is so often repeated, is the basis of every social order and which is presented as the achievement of the maximum result for the minimum cost is in reality nothing but the classic capitalist principle of production for profit which always tends towards the maximum of exploitation. The economic principle of the working class consequently can only be the abolition of exploitation. This principle upon which the fundamental principles is based has until now been a dead letter for the workers. Besides the obvious exploitation in the so-called socialist countries, the academic conferences in the capitalist countries, which address the question of socialism, only refer to systems of state capitalism. Socialist ownership of the means of production is always thought of as state ownership. The administrative distribution of goods with or without a market is always the object of centralized decision-making. As in capitalism, Exploitation comes in two forms, through the continuing separation of the producers from the means of production and through the monopolization of political power. And whenever some kind of right to co-management has been conceded to or imposed upon the workers, the market mechanism combines self-exploitation with state exploitation. Whatever weak points may be found in the fundamental principles in the current situation, today as well as tomorrow, it will still be the starting point for all discussions and serious efforts to bring about a communist society. Do we agree with that? 
do we think it's uh, the starting point for all that serious efforts to bring about a communist society, Slavic? I agree. Yeah, I think the labor time, the right of disposal, and I think it. I think crucially, it gets us away from. It, it gives us a more substantial alternative to like the uh, routes of nationalization that are still quite dominant today. I think it's it's necessary for getting us on the right path. Yeah, that's the way I think about it. Like I think like they literally are the fundamental principles for us to to think logically about what a communist society could be. You know, just a non-exploitative and a system that's com- entirely democratic with open and accounting, you know, where we have our simple formula F plus C plus L and our FIC. I find like they are very, very clear building blocks for all of the things that we want to get from a communist society. Uh, that's fundamentally my, my belief and fundamentally why this book, you know, has kind of meant so much to me. You know, any thoughts on anybody on the palmatic stuff, maybe in general, before we wrap up? Like, what is this? There seems to be a, a great uh, reluctance in in the kind of left, like left communist scene a- against labor time planning for some reason. You know, for something that for me is obviously the way to end exploitation. You know, just by definition, it's there in the math. It's like it kind of baffles me that there is such a pushback against it. You know, it's such a a simple objective way to tr- for us to try and deal with these class relations that it just baffles my mind that there is a a reluctance to 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 see it as the way forward, and also a kind of a reluctance to deal with things that have a a, a tinge of kind of capitalism you know just even a tinge it's like mistaking the form for the content you know i I find that is seemingly that that to me is just all over the scene which kind of i find very uh i i find it quite i kind of find it disturbing to be honest (laughs) it disturbs me anybody have any wrap-up thoughts before we wrap it up for today and the entire session we're limping over the line here today. We're limping over the line. This is like we've been, you know, we're Usain Bolt. We're 70 meters out, uh, 80 meters down the 100 meters, and somebody shoots us in the leg, and then we we limp over in third place. Any, any final thoughts here? It's a very strange introduction because there, there's parts of it where you feel like, did he read the entirety of the book? But I think, you know, it was it was kind of a... A time where the left comes, you know, we're not exactly in a in ascension, you know, when when they wrote that. And he kind of, did, I mean, it's, it feels like half of the introduction is kind of did, trying to do like a historical update. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. It's nearly a post mortem, right, everybody? Well, I think we leave well, it there. It's been a great reading group. Thanks, everybody.